So linking up to what Simon said and partly of what Anna and Larissa did, I'm going to start with a small ethnographic uh, snippet. And this actually concerns a German non-Jewish um, man who immigrated to Israel. Initially, he came here as a volunteer and then he stayed on and he got a visa by way of uh, his uh, respective par uh, girlfriends who followed because you can actually only immigrate to Israel uh, permanently as a non-Jew if you don't make Aliyah with a Jew as the partner or the spouse of an Israeli Jewish citizen. It works as well if, if the citizen is not Jewish, but it's significantly harder. So this guy is called, I called him Stefan. He has actually a very common name in German as well. Um, and he followed actually quite a, a, one of the uh, most common migration uh, trajectories into Israel then by way of this volunteer work. So first he had come to Israel because he had an interest in the country. He had already completed his civic service, which was at that point in time still mandatory in Germany, which like Israel knows a mandatory army service, and met consecutive Israeli female partners who gave him access to a partner visa and had a child with one of these ex-girlfriends. More than 10 years uh, since first coming to Israel, he makes do in Israel, but masters decorated, he scraps by in a job he is overqualified for. Then he told me, if I want to go home, there is no point in even thinking about it. I can't. My daughter is here. Like Ute, that was one of my uh, other participants, he did develop a critical distance to Israel, but he engages in his own private Hasbara efforts to increase the understanding of Israel in Germany and for that reason travels there regularly, which is unlike other German non-Jewish and other Jewish non-Jewish immigrants I had come across. He was actually the only... Uh, one who I met who doubled as a parent and who spoke English, uh, Hebrew with his daughter and decided against passing on his own native language. At the same time, he commented on his, uh, on his love life in Israel. 50% of my matches on Tinder outlined that they are not interested in me when they realize that I am a non-Jew. Eligible partners I meet uh, differently back down when I answer negatively if I made Aliyah. Uh, this is actually the coding for asking, are you Jewish? And if I say no, the reply is most often, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, but I'm traditional. This in turn underlines the aversion towards the inter-Jewish uh, partnership or marriages and that it does not only affect non-Jewish uh, women. Um, and these men are actually no threat to the uh, halachic system of the, and the halachic uh, descent of the children. And Stefan's Germanness, like the Britishness or whatever nationalities they had, uh, pales to grey in front of their non-Jewishness. Yet Stefan uh, conceded that, and that's a quote, I can deal with the fact that I'm a stranger, but what really scares me is Misra Tabnim, indicating that he was highly aware of its very vulnerable position that based on his non-Jewishness and his former partners and the Ministry of the Interior's power over him. So that was one of the um, 85 non-Jewish uh, spouses and partners and former partners I've been interviewing since uh, 2009 and if it's actually part of a much bigger project and it was conducted in, uh, with a mix of quantitative and qualitative and in particular ethnographic methods. And I have to say that it was very difficult to get, my, to get access to these research participants initially because they were incredibly mistrusting towards me because going by my name they recognized I was a Jew so that was completely different from my previous work before in Germany amongst Jews, where my Jewishness was the way in. And here was actually partly, partially the way out. So I actually needed loads of gatekeepers. And as you would see, some of the uh, aversion that came up is going gonna, is gonna to show. So um, I would say that these are the other non-Jews in the Holy Land. And this is actually how they refer to themselves, which is interesting. They have very self-help groups by now and they always refer to themselves as the uh, non-Jews in the Holy Land. But when you look at it in a wider scale of, th of uh, uh, things, they're actually one group of the non-Jews who are in the country. And uh, what I'm going to go through with you briefly are the legal provisions, Israel as a Jewish state, then the core issues, Jewish history, Judaism, the intifadas and labor migration. Matters of personal status, I think we heard a lot about already. There's a, co there's a complete lack of civil marriage. The only thing I'm going to say to that is that uh, what, for example, Mishpacha HaChadasha says to people, common law marriage does not exist in Israel, neither does civil law marriage. So all of these Israelis who believe they take part in the marriage revolution or Israelis who marry non-Jews by that will have these so-called marriages not recognized anywhere abroad and it's not going to affect their personal status in Israel either. So um, I find it actually legally highly problematic what is happening there. 
Um, and then I'm going to introduce you to three of my participants who I met along the way. Um, and, I'm, and that's going to go into their life words, the perceptions they have of Israel, belongings and conflicted and conflated boundaries. And what you're going to see is that their biographies prior to the immigration here play a massive role in how they perceive of the country. So this is the statistic, the latest one, that is one uh, of 2014, which I managed to get out of Misrat Habnim. The current one I'm actually working on because problematically as the other scholars like Daphna Hakka or Tali Kritzmann Amir realize we usually get data sets if we file under the Freedom of Information Act. So who is a Jew and who is married to who is guarded like a state secret? And this is the, uh, these are the marriages which were registered. But at the same time, the problem that you have, of course, is some of these marriages might not be registered or you might, be, you might have people on a wide array of visas. So this is, and there you can see that foreign uh, Jew, uh, Jewish men and foreign non-Jewish women is most common, and that foreign non-Jewish men and uh, Jewish women is, second, uh, is, is, uh, is the second biggest group. But when you look at it in terms of the total of the population, which that statistic does not do, then you get a completely different picture. But what you can see as well is this figure. Here's these 0.3%. Uh, so Jewish Arab couples are the least common one. And uh, despite usually or uh, quite often Israeli Jews and Palestinians of Israeli citizenship not being able to agree on anything, this is for both groups the worst possible marriage. Um, so these are, this is then Israel as a Jewish state. It starts with the Declaration of Independence and then it goes on with, uh, with the first law of return. Simon talked about the amended Rome from 1970 and that's the Shalit case he mentioned. <coughs> Bless you. Nationality law, actually, it's called, it's translated into nationality, it's translated into nationality law, but in, uh, in Hebrew it says Ezra, uh, Ezrahut, which means, which means citizenship. But when you look at how it's conceptualized, we're actually talking Leom, we're talking nationality. Then you have the entry into Israel law, prevention of infiltration, any and all of these laws made it harder and harder for non-Jews to get into the country. So you have an on ongoing uh, legal Judaization of the country. I'm, I'm just talking now Judaization, not theocratization. I'm going to get to that. And one of the particularities about Israel is that parenthood to a minor citizen child does not confer right of abode. It was initially, it was actually aimed obviously at Palestinians. I think that is something which is pretty clear. And then the uh, of Dim Zarim, the uh, foreign workers came. But at the same time, of course, it affects the spouses or the co-parents of those who have children with Israeli Jews. And you, might, you find as well cases where a non-Jewish, it's a non-Jewish Polish mother who was deported with her Israeli citizen uh, child. The father who was Israeli Jewish didn't want anything to do with them. Misrat Habnim refused the visa. And they actually argued that the uh, visa reason of the mother was insufficient to stay in the country. So the, um, the rights of the child were, at least from my perspective, uh, badly dealt with. And that is still standing. It's a case that Akri took up to the Supreme Court. That's the human rights organization. They lost it and were incredibly depressed about it. I guess like loads of people who dealt with these cases. So these are the, uh, the frameworks that we're dealing with. And it ties directly in with the, with, the, with the biggest conflict that this country has, which is uh, the Israeli-Jewish-Palestinian conflict. I mean, Palestinian citizens of Israel are, as you see in those cases down there, if anybody wants them, I have them all on file, um, are treated legally different. They, depending on where their partner comes from, they have no right to family reunion. So that's very different from Jews. But these are all cases that were taken up to the, to the Supreme Court to argue in favor of, the, uh, of citizenship for non-Jewish spouses and as well in regard to who can, uh, who can marry who and how does it work out. What is actually really, really stunning, and that's something that uh, came a bit through in Simon's stuff, Israeli Jews who take that decision to marry non-Jew will go up to the Supreme Court. It's really amazing through how many hoops they're willing and how many barriers they're, supposed, they're, they're willing to take to uh, to get over and how many hurdles and it actually shows the massive conflict which is still around of what is a Jew and who should be con then included into Jewry but as well into Israeli citizenship. So the matters of person status, there it's tied to religious authority, so-called common law marriage that doesn't exist. Uh, yes, uh, Cyprus or Brita Zagyut are the way out but that would be the spousal convent where you live with somebody. And you have a very strong tie between immigration and family law. So that's very clear then. 
Uh, but what we found in the research project that I conducted in Germany with one of my colleagues is that the role of religion in the private sphere, as you see here, is a key reason for emigration. And what you see in the next statistic is that having a German partner or spouse, which is that one here, is a reason for more than 30% of the Israeli immigrant population to actually move to Germany. And when we asked them, they actually outlined that uh, their life in Germany might be difficult and that they'd never be really Germans, but what they go through in Germany doesn't compare to what their spouse would go through in Israel. And this is the ethnography. These are actually some, these are just some snippets of the people who I uh, worked with all along. Let me just hope that I find it. <coughs> no. Okay. Okay, the first person I'm going to introduce you, I called Simone, it's again, it's a very common name, and she actually realized that all of the material which she needed in order to fill in forms in Israel was just issued in Hebrew that concerned her, um, her um, immigration. Um, so when she actually realized that, that, and she realized that all of the info is only available in Hebrew, um, that was for her, that highlighted for her her non-Jewishness. In uh, one of the many interviews and fieldwork conversations, she kept on bringing up this lack of Hebrew and it served as a signifier for her status as an immigrant and more so as a non-Jewish immigrant. Had she been covered by under the law of return, she would have had access to a state-sponsored language course and financial aid. As a non-Jewish spouse of an Israeli Jew, learning Hebrew is her own responsibility, the more difficult given the absence of the formal support structure available to Jewish immigrants. Her lack of a common language with native Israelis was symbolic. Various family members of her husband had asked her to convert and actually already at their, at their, at their wedding, which uh, I thought was really distasteful. Um, she declined, but at the same time, she felt that her non-Jewishness was a stigma and that then, that's a quote, then this Germanness needs to be something good, something special for my son. So you can see it actually goes on to the children because her son would not be considered Jewish under the halacha. Then the next girl is called, she's called Corina. She's originally, or I called her Corina. She's originally Austrian and she said, those whose, whose relationships are not 100% end up leaving. Their experiences with Misrat Abnim definitely contribute to this, was her assessment of the interrelationship. She and her Israeli partner had met in Austria, her native country, when both were halfway through their respective degrees. Her partner had visited Austria while traveling after completing his army service. Corinna's sense of alienation from the Israeli mainstream society strongly hinged on two factors. She lacked the options to progress professionally due to her lack of fever, which again was defined as her private endeavor, and because she's very much her own person, thus refusing to go with the flow. While she acknowledged this freely, she feels that in her native country there, are, there is more space for non-stream individuals. Vienna, as she said, it has a proper alternative scene and she is actually very much with arts in Austria, but I can't go into that. And the last person I'm going to introduce you is called John. John came to Israel in 27. Having met his Israeli Jewish wife in London where she was pursuing postgraduate work, they moved together to Israel where she had found a job and which she wanted to pursue while John left his career. And he was actually really happy to leave it, I have to say. Um, John is a second generation Briton. He is black. He, ha he is highly educated, putting him into the minority position in the country he defines as his primary native country. Overall, black Britons are on average less affluent and have lower educational attainment than their white counterparts. John remarked on this in a conversation. Despite his vivid interest in law, and he's actually, he's Oxbridge educated, um, he, uh, he chose not to pursue career in the legal profession. And that's a quote. I made this decision on the toilet, literally. It was the toilet at the university where I saw another ra racist graffiti and I realized I do not belong here and they do not want me here. So these are, the, these are like three of these uh, more than 80 people. And when you look at what they're, what they're going through, it's actually the ethno-religious boundaries as serves as well as the national boundary and it's an ethno-sexual boundary. And it's actually what I found interesting and which I have to admit was counterintuitive to me is that men are hit as badly as women. Most of the time, these, because I focus on global northerners, they refuse to convert because they put themselves in a very specific position vis-a-vis -vis Israelis. And they did once they trusted me, they would actually talk a lot about the self-righteousness and the tribalism and how they couldn't understand how one can run this uh, pseudo-democratic uh, state. So I got as well loads of, uh, from them on that matter. 
But what you can see is as well that the aversion towards interpartnership, intermarriage runs ar across the macro, meso, and micro levels. So they talked about this uh, in regard to the legal structures, then meso structures, bureaucracy, and on the micro level. Um, the biographies prior to immigration are highly de decisive how they deal with the country here. So John was very much, he did not even think that he was not going to be discriminated against, and he still says he has never been discriminated against in Israel. Whereas these, uh, these, you could say, white Christian Europeans who always belonged to the majority in their native countries had never ever encountered discrimination. And as they themselves did not take any uh, racist stances in the countries they were from, because they had loads of criticism about wherever f f um, France, Austria, Germany, uh, Switzerland, which as well highly ethnocentric countries. So they did not expect what was going to come their way. However, the integration works via the families and informal groups. Yes, I'm done now. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm adhering to you. Um, and the informal groups are actually, and that was something which I guess for, for an anthropologist who has worked as well as sociology was very interesting. It's based on non-Jewish homophily. It's not based on citizenship. It's not based on gender, religion, and language. So everything that we always look at in terms of social networks with these people didn't quite work out that way. Okay. Say it again, the last thing. They, uh, the informal groups are based on non-Jewishness or non-Jewish status. So they're not based on uh, language. They're not based on citizenship. You know, everything you usually have. Because, you know, I've, as I've dealt with these guys now since uh, 2009, I know their groups. There is no single group which is called, for example, uh, Anglo, Anglican Christians in Israel or American Baptists. They, they completely run around, uh, go, go along, move along those lines. And they will use, usually they use English as lingua franca, but if there is somebody who speaks whatever native language it is, and it's a complex question, they might answer in that language. But even at, you know, huge gatherings that they set up, it's like, it's, it's a complete mix of languages. And this is how they, they re and they relate to each other as, as fellow non-Jews. So you could say it's a community of faith. Community of otherness. Yeah, you could say that, but in a different, I mean, they actually, in some ways, how they close the, you know, how they, they, how, how they close, how the gatekeeping work actually reminded me of Jews in Germany, like, you know, the, the bunch who was there before the Russian immigration, mm -hmm. when, you know, they treated Russians, which wasn't exactly commendable. But uh, yeah, it's as well, and they see themselves as, you know, being fated to be here, and of course, parenthood massively plays into it, because... Yeah, that is pretty much the conclusion, yeah. Yeah, that we're looking at. Well, let's go, so we'll ask you more questions when we come to that.